righty. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let, me, whoop, let me get the sign-in sheet and whatnot passed around. Okay, so um, welcome back to our lovely 8 o'clock in the morning time slot uh, of Mechanics and Deformable Bodies. Um, a, a few quick announcements. Um, so, like I said, I am going to try and hold to the schedule pretty closely this semester with this course. And so we're actually at the point, at least after lecture today, where it's a good idea to uh, give you all a homework assignment. And I'm going to pull that up here in a second to, to show you. Um, so the homework assignment is going to be on the fundamentals of uh, stress and strain. Uh, I'm giving that today, and I'm going to pull that up here in a second. And it's not due Tuesday, but it's due the following Tuesday. So you got like a week and a half on it. Um, after lecture today, you should be able to do just about every problem on the assignment except for maybe the last one. But the last problem on the assignment, uh, you'll definitely know how to do uh, by Tuesday. Speaking of Tuesday, it's probably not a bad idea for you to bring a laptop to class, uh, preferably one with Excel. Um, we're going to be looking at some data, uh, some stress strain data, uh, and, and plotting some stress strain curves and whatnot. And so having Excel uh, is a good idea. But also, let me go ahead and just say this. I'm, I'm pretty easy guy to get along with. Um, I post all the notes online and whatnot. So if you all just want to bring a laptop in general, you're more than welcome to. I, I have no problem with that at all. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, so yeah, bring your laptops. We should definitely get to that Tuesday. Honestly, that uh, stress strain example might bleed a little bit into Thursday, so it might not be a bad idea uh, to have one Thursday as well. But uh, we just wanted to bring that up. Sound good? Okay, so uh, also I wanted to bring up Blackboard just to show you uh, how I do the assignment so that you're aware of that. Um, oh, might help if I actually load up Blackboard. Okay, so I'm in student preview mode, so this should be what you, what you see. If you go to course content, you should see homework assignment number one right there. So you know, it's in a PDF form. Here, here's my homework assignment. So right off the bat, I always like to put, you know, here's when it was assigned and here's when it was due, so it's there on the assignment. Um, there are four problems. Uh, they're all coming out of the book. Uh, problem number four is the one that's a little bit different because you're going to be using Excel to plot the data. Basically, the way problem number four works is you're given some load and deflection data from a representative stress-strain test, and you have to plot it and, and interpret some values. So that, that's where uh, Excel comes into play. After today, you should be able to attack uh, everything else, though. Uh, just so you're aware, the problems are weighted. So this assignment is like, I got three 10-point problems and a 15-point problem. So the assignment as a whole is worth 45 points. The, the way that I grade the homework assignments, just so you're aware, is this assignment's worth 45 points. Maybe the next one's worth 35, one's 40, one's 20, what have you. Basically, I just say, here's the total number of homework points throughout the semester, and here's how many you earn, and that's how you get your homework grades. So I want you all to be aware. And plus, I know when final exam time comes around, there's the at-home game that I know you'll play. Like, what do I need to get on the final to get a, a B or an A or, or, or what have you? So just, just so you're aware of that, I like to keep that as transparent as possible. All right, um, sound good? Okay. Uh, also, when time comes around, like after we grade it and whatnot, I do post solutions. So I, I do provide that because there's no, I, I don't really see a big reason not to. So, okay. All right, so uh, unless there's any other questions, I want to go ahead and get started into the material. So let me sort of recap where we left off last time. So if you recall, last time we were, uh, just, you know, after doing the, the book, you know, housekeeping and course introduction and all that stuff, we started talking about this concept of stress, okay? And, and stress is going to be one of the most important concepts that we deal with throughout this entire course. Because stress, as we gleaned from this example, because I thought this was a really good example to, uh, to demonstrate this, stress really sort of gave us an insight into as to how we engineers design. You know, everybody in here should be somewhat familiar with a trust analysis, but we took this trust analysis just a smidgen step forward and we said, well, let's not look at the forces inside these members, let's look at the stresses inside these members. So remember, stress is basically a normalized expression of force. Instead of saying force, it's force per unit area. And the reason why it was so valuable, uh, bless you, the reason why it was so valuable is if, um, you know, if, all these or if all these members are made of the same material and they're all the same size, 
we can look at the stresses and start making some serious design decisions. So we looked at, I think one of the members in the trust was way over designed. And then when we looked at the other two, the stresses were pretty comparable, but if you've got a, a maximum stress or an allowable stress, then one of those members was under designed. So we had one member that was really too big, one member that was a little too small, one that was probably right where it needed to be. So it gives you some insight in terms of design. I don't care whether you're a civil engineer or mechanical engineer, the concept of stresses and how they relate to design is something you're going to carry with, carry with you throughout your engineering career. So it's, it's a pretty uh, important concept. Uh, are there any questions about that or, or this example or anything before we move forward? Okay. So I've got another example that I want to do with you. Um, this example is really sort of, it, it's again trying to shake off a little bit of the rust from, from some of these uh, calculations. This example um, uh, sort of takes a, a step away from all this, this heavy, heavy static stuff and it starts getting more into the specifics of stresses. So there's a lot of section properties that we'll have to compute and, and some bookkeeping that we have to deal with. Um, it's a little bit analytical, a little bit theoretical, but again, the idea is to get you more comfortable and more familiar with uh, stresses and, and, and how they work. So what I've got here is I've got a, a, a two-tier pipe system that's sort of mounted to the ceiling. So each of these pipes have different you know, outside and inside diameters. So it's a pipe, so the, uh, the, the middle is hollow. So like, for instance, for the upper pipe, it has an outer um, diameter of two and three eighths of an inch, and the inner diameter is two inches. So I think if, if uh, stress is defined as force per unit area, we're going to need these diameters in order to determine the areas. Um, the lower pipe is a little bit bigger. Now, um, what we've been given is we know the load on, uh, on this, uh, this first segment, this PA. And the purpose of the example is to try and find PB uh, under a series of scenarios. So the first one is find, figure out what PB is so that this stress up here is 2100 PSI. And then the second one is, well, what does PB need to be so that the two stresses are equal? Again, it's just trying to familiarize yourself a little bit with these, uh, these stress computations. So let me go ahead and, uh, and, and pull up my handy dandy little notebook thing on the screen. We can start doing some, some examples. Um, one thing to point out, this was example 2A. We're going to go back to this example here in a little bit when we start looking at strain. So, uh, so, so just so you're aware of that. So there will be more to add to this example uh, here in a little bit. All right. So. All right. And that's big enough. Everybody can read that? Right. So here we've got... Uh, our pipe segment. Oh, I help if I'm actually drawing. And it sort of goes like this. And it sort of goes like this. I'm sort of drawing it a little exaggerated, but for, for our purposes, it's no big deal. Okay. Now, for our loads, we've got, you know, some load that's sort of acting on this first portion. And that was a load PA, and it was 1,750 pounds. Okay. Now, there's also a load down here. And this is PB. But we don't, we don't know what PB is. Okay. Um, we need to figure out what PB is under a, a, a series of different uh, scenarios. Okay, so what I'm going to do is this, okay? I'm going to use the secret weapon of, of, of engineering, which is a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, and I'm going to start cutting sections through these pipes. So let's, and you'll see why I'm doing this uh, here in a second, okay? So for the sake of discussion, okay, let's call this, let's call this one right here, let's call this pipe two, and let's call this pipe one, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start cutting a section through each of these pipes. Okay, let's cut a section through each pipe. All right, so 
I'm going to cut uh, two sections, so we'll call it section one and section two. So we'll say I have a section here, call it section one, we'll put a section right here, we'll call it section two. Okay, now let's just keep this simple, keep it straightforward. Let's start off with the lower one. I think the lower one's a little easier to understand. Okay. So I got my samurai sword or my lightsaber, and I've got this pipe system hanging, okay? In fact, I might go away from my, you know, sketch here because I think it's a little easier. Okay. So, so here's my pipe system, okay? And I got my samurai sword or lightsaber, and I cut right here. So I cut this right in half. What happens? Like physically, what would happen if I did that? What's it? It, it would fall down. What would fall down? This, this part down here would fall down, right? That lower portion would be in default. So if my foot was there, I'd have a bad day. Okay? So if I look at section 2-2, two, two, so I'll put this over here. I'll put section 2-2 two, two over here. What I've got is I've got a pipe that looks something like that, and I've got this PB load. All right? And here's where I've cut. You're telling me it would fall down. Okay? The reason why it would fall down is by cutting section, I've removed from that pipe the ability to resist that load, so it's just going to fall. So what that means is, is at that section cut and inside that pipe, there's some internal force inside that pipe keeping it up, right? Make sense? So I'm going to call that P2, okay? I'm going to call it P2 because I'm cutting through the second pipe. So would you agree that just based off equilibrium, uh, if I sum forces in the y direction, that P2 has got to be whatever PB is. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the easy one. Now let's look at the, the first one. Let's look at section 1, 1. Okay, so if I cut a section through 1, 1, it's not going to be just this little piece that falls down. It's going to be the whole thing that falls down, right? Not just a little bit, the whole thing. So, if I cut a section through 1, 1, it's going to look something like this. So I got this. I got this. So I got PA and PB. And I've got my section cut. So again, if I cut through pipe one, that whole thing's going to fall down. Because inside pipe number one, there's force keeping it upright, right? So how much force is inside pipe number one? It's not PB, it's what? PA plus PB, okay? So this is P1. If I sum forces in the y direction, P1 is PA plus PB. And if that's a little confusing, just think about it like this. Okay? Here, here's, my, uh, here's my pipe assembly. Okay? Conceptualize that you got your foot right under this assembly. What's going to hurt more if I cut through this or I cut through that? Cut through the, bo the bottom portion, right? If I cut through the top portion, my foot is going to experience the full weight of not just PB, but PA plus PB. Okay? Does that make sense? So is everybody okay with that? Why that upper pipe is carrying both of them? Not just it's not just PA, it's P plus PB. Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. So if you've got that, then you've got a lot of the conceptual difficulties figured out. Okay? The only thing that you've got to consider now is stresses. See, we, we, we don't really care in this course so much about the forces. What we care about are the stresses. So let's take each of these one at a time, okay? Um, if, I, if I have, let's say, segment one, if I have the force in segment one, how do I determine the stress in segment one? What do I do? I take force and do what with it? Divide by area, right? So the stress in that first segment is whatever the force in the first segment is divided by whatever the area is in the first segment. Everybody okay with that? Same thing with the second segment. So the stress in this segment is whatever the force is divided by whatever the area is. So I'm going to call that A1 and A2. I'm trying to be consistent with my naming. 
anything I say for, for like sub one, uh, four sub one, stress sub one, that's the top set or the top pipe. The second pipe, the lower pipe, I'll call that sigma sub two. Am I good? Okay. So in order to determine stresses, we need forces and we need areas. Now, the, the point of the problem is to try and determine some forces if some scenarios happen. But what we can go ahead and determine right now are the areas, okay? So let's, let's look at some of these areas off to the side. Okay, now let's be clear, okay? We're talking about pipes, okay? So remember, samurai sword or lightsaber, if I cut through the pipe and I look at the pipe, again, I'm looking at that cross-sectional area, well, what am I looking at? I'm looking at, you know, I've got this circular segment with a hole in it, and, and what I'm trying to determine is that shaded area right there. That's about the best circle you're going to get out of me. So that, that's about all you can get. Okay, so let's call this, you know, the outer diameter and this the inner diameter. Okay, how do you determine, well first off, let's just keep it simple. How do you determine the area of a circle? We have pi r squared, or if we want to be lazy, we could say pi d squared divided by 4, right? Pi r squared or pi d squared over 4, okay? So, how, so if you know how to determine the area of a circle, how would you determine the area of this pipe, this cross-sectional area of the pipe? How would you do that? The area of the, the bigger circle minus the area of the smaller circle, exactly right. So what we can do is we can say, all right, we can say that this is going to be pi over 4 d naught squared minus pi over 4 d i squared or pi over 4 d naught squared minus d i squared. Everybody okay with that? Okay. If you're okay with that, then let's take a look at some of our data from the problem, okay? So here's our problem. Let's take a look at the upper pipe, okay? So what's our diameter on the upper pipe? What is it? 2, 2.375 is like 2 and 3 eighths. And for the inner diameter, it's the 2 inches, right? So for that upper pipe, what I can do is I can say, all right, therefore, a1 pi over 4 times the outer diameter squared minus the inner diameter squared, right? So now I've got to ask you to break out your calculators and tell me what you're doing. Like, huh, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. It's too early for calculators. So, we're engineers. What we got for a uh, for for a, a, a decimal value? Let's say three decimal places, just for the heck of it. Whoever whoever has it. One point. I like what two eight nine. Okay. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Good. Remember, I'm going to ask. I'm going to make sure that you all are, are awake. Okay, so for the second pipe, for that lower pipe, what do we got? Okay, so the lower pipe, we have an outer diameter of what? Two and a half. Inner diameter of two and a quarter. So let's see what we get there. So that one, oh, go away. That one is pi over four. 2.5 squared minus 2.25 squared. Now, I'm perfectly okay with decimals in here. We're engineers. So what do we got? Point nine three three. Do we got a second on that? All right. Okay. 
So is everybody okay with that? You know, remember, stress equals force over area, so now we've got the, the areas. Okay. Okay. So everybody good? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and switch on over to the next panel because I'm running out of space on this. Um, but I'm going to rewrite a couple formulas just so that we have them. Okay, so... Okay, so uh, just so, so we have, have it documented, so we have sigma 1 was, what was that? That was PA, I was using little, little letters, PA plus PB over A1 and sigma 2 was PB over A2. Was that right? Okay, and then we also had that A1 was 1.289 square inches and A2 was 0 0.933 square inches. Did I do that right? Or I get that backwards? Let's see. Oh, I got that right. Okay. Okay. Sound good? All right. So I'd say up until now, really all we were doing was just sort of deriving some formulas and calculating some basic properties. Let's actually do some, uh, some math here. But, but before we do that, I do want to write one other piece of information. We do know what PA is. PA is 1,750 pounds. So that's another thing. When we do our stress calculations, we've got pounds and square inches, so everything's going to come out in PSI. Okay. So now let, let's actually read the, the problem a little bit. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. And, and just as a, a future sort of tidbit on homeworks and exams and things like that, that's sort of how a lot of this stuff works in, in, in a class like this. Like, you know, you're doing an, a, a problem either on a homework or an exam. One of the first things you may need to do is just start computing some properties and calculating some values, like computing areas and figuring out what the stresses would be. If you have those formulas, it makes attacking these challenges a whole lot easier. Let, let's take each of them one at a time and let's see what we get. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Okay, so let's determine PB so that the stress in the upper segment is 2100 PSI. So we're talking about the stress up here, right? So this is sigma sub 1, okay? So here's another way of writing that first question, okay? So if I have this, let's look at part 1. Part 1. If sigma sub 1 is 2100 PSI, PB is what? That's basically what it's saying, right? Okay. So let's look at the expression for sigma 1. Let's just take a look at this formula, okay? Let me ask this. Do we know what A1 is? What is it? It's the 1.289. Okay. Do we know what PA is? Yeah, it's, it's 1,750 pounds. Do we know what this is? Yeah, 2,100. So what do we not know? PB. So plug and chug. So, so let's do a little bit of algebra. So let's multiply that over. Sigma 1 A1 equals PA plus PB subtract over, so therefore PB is sigma 1 A1 minus PA. Not too bad, right? So let's plug and chug. So we have sigma 1, okay, sigma 1 is 2100 PSI. We have 1.289 square inches minus 1,750 pounds. Now, here's another general piece of advice that I have for you, and this will really help with this class, but not just this class, just in general, okay? Look at what I wrote on, on the board. I didn't say 2,100 times 1.289. No, I wrote 2,100, and I took the time to write the little p, and the little s, and the little i. I didn't, I don't know if I dotted the i. Did I dot the i? No, I didn't dot the i. English folks will tell me. Um, and then I wrote the i, and the little n, and then the little two above that write out your units. I know it takes a couple extra seconds, but do it because when you actually start carrying out your calculations, 
tracking your units matters, okay? So, like for instance, if I take pounds per square inch and multiply it by square inches, what do I get? I get pounds. So now I'm taking pounds and subtracting pounds, now everything makes sense, okay? So just make sure that you're tracking your units. It, it, it can be a, a, a little bit of an issue. So what do we have here uh, when we calculate this out? What do we get? So PB is 956.1, what'd you say? 0.9. Do I have a second on that? All right, so that's in pounds. And there we go. So sometimes I abbreviate answer and I just say ANS. So if you ever see me write ANS, that's just answer. So far so good? Okay, now let's take the, uh, the second challenge. This one's a little bit more algebra, but it's not so bad. So the second one says, okay, now let's figure out PB. So whatever PB is, that the stress in segment one and segment two are equal, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, instead of setting this stress equal to 2,100 pounds, I'm going to set this stress equal to that stress and similarly solve for PB. So this one's just going to be a little bit more algebra. Um, let's look at part two. And can you all read this? Is this good? Good size? Okay. All right. So this one is saying... If actually, actually, you know what? Before before we start this, um, before we start this, I, I'm sorry. I do want to do something off to the side. I do want to do something off to the side. On part one, I want to check. I want to do a, a little check. Sorry, sorry for getting tracked off, but I want to do something. All right. For part one, how do we calculate the stress uh, in the, the the top segment? We take PA plus PB divided by A1, right? So, uh, 1,750 pounds plus 956.9 pounds divided by uh, 1.289. Does that come out to 2,100? I just want to make sure. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to go too off on a tangent, but... One of the things about a lot of these problems is that once you get an answer, more often than not, you can verify it. So, what did, we, did we get 2,100? Maybe some decimals and whatnot, but yeah, that comes out to 2,100 PSI. So, Okay. So we'll say that's check for part one. Okay. All right. Just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Back to part two. So with part two, we're setting sigma one equal to sigma 2, so if sigma 1 equals sigma 2, what is PB? Okay, so for part 2, what I've really got is I've got this. I've got PA plus PB divided by A1 equals PB over A2. Fair point? All right, so what do we have to solve for? We've got to solve for what, PB? So how do we do this algebraically? Tell me what's the first step. Probably what I would do is cross multiply. So I've got PA plus PB times A2 equals PB times A1. Everybody okay with that? I'm going to distribute that multiplication uh, out on the left. So I've got PA a2 plus PB, A2 equals PB, A1. Everybody following with me? All right. Get everything that I want to figure out onto one side of the equation. So I'm going to move this uh, PB over to the, uh, to the right. So PA, A2 equals PB, A1 minus PB, a2. Now we can factor over on the right. So PA A2 equals PB A1 minus A2. Everybody okay with that? Right. Actually, let me move some of this stuff over a little bit. What's up here? Move some of that. 
that stuff out. Got a little bit more room. You can't do that on a whiteboard, so sometimes I get a little spoiled of that stuff. Okay, so back to here. If we want to solve for PB, maybe I'll just sort of put this over here. PB is PA A2 divided by A1 minus A2. Okay. Knows a little bit more algebra, but is everybody okay with that? So now this is plug and chug because we know what PA is and we know what our areas are. So we have 1,750 pounds times, now A2, was that the 0.933? And then, so what are we getting? Anybody got an answer? Forty-five, eighty-six pounds, something like that. Okay. Now, that seems a little bigger than the last one, doesn't it? Does it seem a little like maybe that's not the right answer? If it does, that's fine. Let's check it. Okay. So. Okay, let's check that. How do we determine the stress in the upper segment? We take 1,750 pounds plus 4586 pounds divided by 1.289. Did I do that right? So what do we get for stress in that top segment? We'll just keep it like to the nearest PSI, just, just for sake of checking. 49.17. Do I have a second on that? 49.15. Sound good? Okay. Now what about the lower segment? How do I determine the stress in the lower segment? I just take PB divided by 0 0.933. And what do I get here? 49.15. And that's when we do an eraser drop. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I'm a dork. I know. It's okay. <laughs> All right. What do you think? This isn't too bad, right? Not, not too bad, right? There, there's a problem on your homework that's very similar to this. Like, it's asking for very, very similar uh, type stuff. So, Sound good? Okay. All right, so if, if there's any questions, uh, if not, I'm going to move on to sort of a somewhat related topic. Um, so, everybody good? All right, okay, so we've been talking a lot about stress, okay? Now I want to talk about strain, okay? And let me sort of explain where, where this is going, okay? This is a course on deformable bodies, okay? Well, you know, we put load on stuff, it deforms. So maybe we should discuss deformation, okay? Now, the, the reason why stress is such a useful concept is because stress is sort of a normalized expression of force, you know? Instead of talking about forces, we're talking about forces per unit area, okay? And so it's sort of a way of kind of taking the geometry out of the equation, but it doesn't completely take the geometry out of the equation. Um, stress is our way of normalizing force. Strain is our way of normalizing deflection. 
Okay. So basically, in a nutshell, instead of uh, talking about how much something deforms, we're going to be talking about how much something deforms per unit length. So it's sort of like percentage. And that's what strain is. Okay. So to give you kind of an idea, let, let's take uh, just you know, some element and let's put some load on it. Okay. So this can be a bar, you know, a, a, a beam, what have you. It doesn't really matter. Okay. And, and uh, for, for, our, for our purposes and for the sake of the image, we're only going to consider axial deformation, but you're going to see strains prop up from all sorts of different types of, uh, of loading scenarios. So what's going on is this, okay? And, and sort of the easiest way to imagine this is it almost looks like a piece of taffy or something. But let's say I have a bar and I take it and I apply load to it, okay? If I put load on a bar, it deforms. In this case, if I'm pulling on something, it's going to stretch, okay? So an easy way to understand the math is, let's say I have a piece of like taffy or a big rubber band or something like that in my hand. And let's say originally that rubber band is 10 inches long, just 10 inches. Okay, so I'm holding it right here and it's about 10 inches long. And let's say I stretch it. Okay, now this is a rubber band or a piece of taffy or something like that, so it's really, really stretchy. Okay, now let's say it's 10 inches and I stretch it out to where it's 11 inches. So how much longer did it get? One inch, right? Okay. So its deformation is one inch. That's how much it deforms is one inch. We would say in this case its strain is 10% or 0.1 because it's 10 inches and I made it one inch longer. So that change in length divided by the original length is what we call strain. Okay. So, so if you want a very simple definition for strain, it's that. It's the change in length divided by the original length. So from a mathematical perspective, I've got you know, the 10-inch piece of rubber band, and then it becomes 11 inches. So its change in length is the 11 inches minus the 10 inches, or that delta x prime minus delta x, divided by the original length. Okay? So everybody okay with that? Now, one thing to point out, Based on this definition, what are the units of strain? If I'm saying, you know, change in length divided by the original length, what are the units? There are none, okay? It's common that you'll see, you know, in some engineering textbooks, you'll see somebody say strain is inches per inch or millimeters per millimeters. But from a mathematical perspective, that strain has no units at all, okay? Um, so, so be aware of that. Another thing to be aware of when it comes to strain, and, I, and I'm going to tell you this now, and we're going to see this in this example, it is not that uncommon. In fact, it's very common when you're computing strain values for they to be very small. Okay? And what I mean by that is you will calculate strains, and they'll be 0.00013 or something. That's common. Okay? Um, it's common in engineering applications to even refer to micro strains, to multiply them by a million so that they have a little bit of uh, depth to them uh, and whatnot. So, so just be aware if you're doing math, if you're on homework or on an exam or something, and you're calculating strains and they come out really small, that's actually a good sign. Okay, so you know, I, I know sometimes when you're doing this math, like there's no way that value can be that. No, the strain values can be quite small. Um, so yeah, so strain is mathematically defined as the change in length or the total deformation divided by the original length. Now, if we're talking about changes and rates of change from a, like a, a calculus perspective and a mathematical perspective, we're, we're almost talking about a derivative. So for instance, if you have a function that defines how much uh, something deformed, like a u of x, this is how much this function deformed. If you take the derivative of that function, That'll give you the strain. That might be something uh, that we reference a little bit later, but it's just something I, I wanted to, uh, to bring up. Now, uh, this definition that I'm talking about right now is a definition for normal strain. Remember we had normal stresses and we had shearing stresses? Well, right now I'm talking about normal strain, taking something and applying a stress in this fashion, in sort of a perpendicular fashion. What if I'm shearing something? What if I'm, I'm applying load parallel? Uh, how does that work? Well, if normal strain is sort of a rate of change of length, shearing strain is really sort of a rate of change of the angle. Okay? 
Um, we won't really use like the trig definition that you see down here, or this limit definition very heavily, but we will see shear strains pop up when we start talking about things like torsion and we start talking about beam shears and whatnot. The idea of the change of angle will pop up and it's really uh, prevalent in torsion. We'll take you know, a circular shaft and we'll twist it and we'll try and determine not only how much torque are we applying, but we'll ask how much does it twist. And so that angle of twist and that rate of change, we're, we're talking about that, that shearing strain. So that's just something to be aware of for what you'll see later. I just wanted you to be, um, be you know, privy and be, be uh, uh, oriented to the idea that strains might also refer to, uh, to angle changes. Um, everybody okay with that? Okay. What I want to do is I want to go back to this example, uh, and I want to start looking at some strain stuff. I don't want to use like a different example right now because we already did so much work computing all the areas and we got the lengths and stuff like that. So I, I don't want to uh, go back and reorient myself. Since this example is fresh in our heads, let's just use it, okay? So I've got this same two-tiered pipe system, and I've got some loads on it. And what I've got here is sort of another related question. So let's take this, this uh, segment, and let's say this. Let's say after we put these loads on it, this PA and PB, it doesn't really matter what they are for this example, but you can give it some numbers if, if it helps. Let's say this is 1750 and let's say this is 2000, what have you, it doesn't really matter. Um, let's say after we put those loads, I mean think, if I put 1750 pounds on this and like 2000 pounds on this, it's going to stretch, right? It's going to go down, okay? Let's say that before and after that this point goes down 0.138 and this point goes down 0.295. This is sort of like putting a ruler right next to it and actually measuring how far down those points go from beginning to end. And the question is, what is the strain in each of those segments? So let's see if we can, uh, let's see if we can figure that out. All right. So, Okay, so here's our pipe system. Okay, now we've got our loads on it. All right, so we'll call that PA and PB. Now, one piece of information that was actually included in our last example but really didn't care about in our last example were the lengths of these pipe segments, okay? This first pipe segment up here, this is L1 is 14 inches, okay? This one down here is L2 is 16 inches. See, it didn't really matter for stresses. Stresses are defined as force per unit area. The length does, it doesn't play into it. But for strains, the length very, it does matter because it's the change in length over the original length. Okay? So let, let's see what's going on here. Now, we were given two pieces of, of information. Okay? So we were given that you know, for this problem, So we were given that the deflection, let, let me get some numbers, or let me get some names here. Um, I'm going to call this right here, I'm going to call this point X, and I'm going to call this point Y. And I'm just going to do that for, for naming convention. What we were told in the problem was that the change in length at point X was 0 0.138 inches. And then we were given that the, the deflection at point Y was 0 0.295. Okay? Everybody okay with that? And let me, let me pull the, the, defin or the problem up so that everybody's okay with this. Determine the strange, uh, the strange in each segment if the upper segment stretches 0.138 inches and the total downward displacement at the bottom is 0.295 inches. So what that's saying is that this point 
went down 0.138, and this point went down 0.295. Everybody okay with that? All right. Now, let's start looking at axial strain. Okay, so we calculate strain, and it's a, a lowercase epsilon, which, by the way, I guess I should have mentioned, we do see some Greek letters in here. So this is delta over L. So you'll get used to the Greek alphabet in here. Um, you'll, you'll see that here and there. Okay, so change in length over the original length. Do we know the original length of these segments? Yeah, we got 14 inches and 16 inches. What about the change in length? I'm going to ask you some some trick. I'll say trick questions. I want you to think about it. How much does that upper segment stretch, like from beginning to end? How much longer does it get? How much does it stretch? It's that 0.138, right? What about the lower segment? How much does that lower segment stretch? Is it 0.295? What's that? It's the difference between the two. It's not the 0.295. It's 0.295 minus that. Because that, because think, if this point goes down 0.138 inches, then this segment just sort of goes along for the ride with that. It's just sort of, sort of riding along. It only stretches whatever the difference between those two is. So I've got L1 is 14 inches, and I've got L2 is 16 inches. I've got delta 1 is 0 0.138 inches, but delta 2 is 0 0.295 minus 0 0.138. So what is that? That's 0 0.157. Sound good? So to calculate our strains, it is 0 0.138 inches divided by 14 inches and that is 0 0.157 inches divided by 16 inches. So what are we getting for these values? So like, let's take the top one. And probably like five decimal places is going to be ne necessary because we're going to have 0. Point, like 0, 0. What are we getting? This one down here. 986. And this one's 0, 0.00, what we got? Nine eight one. Do I have seconds on that? All right. So again, well, first off, that's our answer. And again, strains are small. So don't get freaked out if you get a small answer when it comes to strains. Okay? Sound good? Any questions on that? Okay. Okay. Now, let's take a look at this example. This example is just, it's a little bit more on the geometry side. Uh, it's it's um, it's not really meant to uh, uh, test your I mean, you're testing mechanics a little bit, but it's really just more on the geometry side. Now, probably the most important word in this example is this word right here, rigid. Okay, I have a rigid beam that's supported by bars A and B shown below. Let me sort of give you a a, a, a disclaimer. We're in a course on deformable bodies. So, Dr. Mike, what the heck are you doing with rigid elements in an example? Okay. I'm doing it for two reasons. One, I just want to orient you to the concept of strain, so I'm throwing this example at you. But two, from an analytical perspective, it can make sense. For example, um, if I have a steel beam that's being supported by rubber bands, do you think it would be a reasonable assumption that I could assume that that steel beam is rigid? I would say yeah, because steel is so much more stiff than a rubber band that the comparison between those two deflections are going to be, it's going to be so minuscule, like the, the deflection in the, in the steel beam. But if I had a steel beam that was supported by other steel elements, 
well, then I don't think it would be relevant to uh, assume that the beam is rigid. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm, using, I'm using this just as, as a comparison uh, just so that you kind of get a little bit of a dose of reality in what we're talking about. So for the sake of discussion, let's say we've got like a steel beam supported by something that's very, very not stiff, like maybe a rubber band or, or something like that. Um, now, I've got these, these steel beams, and they're supported by this load that you see here on, the, uh, uh, on the, the far right. Now, after that load is applied, what happens is we get a strain in this bar of 0 0.006. My question is, what's the str resulting strain over here? So if that strain's 0 0.006, what's that strain? Now, one thing I'll mention, we are assuming that the beam is rigid. Later on, we will talk about how to handle beam deflections. Beams behave, their behavior is a little bit trickier and a little bit more complicated than bars, so beams we deal with later, but it's just something uh, I wanted you to be aware of. With. We, we do deal with bend, bending stuff uh, later. Okay. 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 So, what I'm going to do is this. Okay, I'm going to be a little lazy. Uh, I think it's in stepping tool. Yep, I'm going to be a little lazy. I apologize. Okay, so, sorry, but I'm lazy. All right, so here's our beam. Now, what I've got here is, is I've got an image of the beam in really its undeflected shape. Now, I, I screen clip that in because that's really not as important as what the beam looks like once it has deflected, okay? Now, remember, the beam cannot bend, okay? It cannot you know, flex and bend. So that beam, if it's straight now, it's going to be straight later, okay? Now, here I've got the, the system. I've got a hinge right here that's pinning this beam to the wall. Now, there's these two rods, but these two rods can stretch. So I propose that if the beam bend, or if the, that load is applied, that the only thing that happens is the beam does this, and it remains straight. Everybody okay with that? Now, we're talking about really, really small deflections, so I don't think we need to worry too much about the bar stretching or anything. But uh, for the sake of, of exaggerating the image so that we can see it, I propose that what it really looks like is this. So here's the beam before it deflects. There's the hinge. Here's what the beam looks like after. Something about like that. Okay? Now, this is rigid, but these are not. These deform. So those bars get stretched along. You pull that thing down, this is going to stretch some, and this is going to stretch some. So however much that stretches, I propose whatever this dimension is, that's the deflection in that bar. And whatever that dimension is, that's the deflection in that bar. Does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? Sound good? Okay. Now, if you understand that, then I think this is a pretty straightforward example, okay? Because we know a couple things. We know that strain is defined as the deflection over L. And we know if the strain in that first bar is 0 0.006, then what is the strain in the first bar. So let's reason through this. We know what, what, what 
geometric property do we know about both bars? Just looking at the image. What's that? Their original length. We know what their original length is, right? We know that the length of bar A is four feet, right? And if you want to convert it into inches, you can. You can say that's 48 inches. We know that the length of bar B is three feet or 36 inches, right? So what I want you to do is just start looking at the, the, the data that we're given. And just let me, let me ask you this. Given that strain value and those lengths, not even looking at this image, what can we go ahead and compute right now? We know the strain in that first bar and we know the length of that first bar, so what can we compute? The deflection in that first bar, right? So we can compute that. So let's go ahead and do that. I propose that the deflection in bar A, how do we do that? Here's our formula here on that box up top, that blue box. So how do we compute the deflection in bar A? Or, or, uh, or bar B, sorry, bar B. Yeah, so the strain times the length, right? So I've got 0 0.006 times 36 inches. What do I get? Uh, well, that's, uh, you're, you're making a, a good point. As long as your units are consistent, that's actually fine. I think, though, uh, depending upon the scenario, uh, because you're dealing with strain, sometimes giving a little bit of volume and a little bit of magnitude to the uh, values isn't the worst thing in the world. Plus, I think it's easier to think of deflection in inches than feet. That's just me. What are we getting here? 0 0.216 what? Inches. Okay, so would you agree that if this bar experiences that much strain and it's that long, that's how much it deforms? Sound good? Now, here's where the, the image and the geometry comes into play. This right here is a straight line. That is a straight line. So if I know what this is, I can determine what this is. How do I do that? I propose that delta B is to three feet as delta A is to eight feet. Now, how did I get that? This is what I did. I said this triangle here and this triangle here. So if I know, so because they're straight, that's the same ratio. And so if I know what this deflection is, I can determine what this deflection is. That dimension is 3. This dimension is 3 plus 5. Sound good? It's not too bad, right? So... If I've got, oh, I've got delta, did I have a mistake? No, you're fine. If, I mean, you no, know, well, that's a good question. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm using this distance here, the, the horizontal distance. That's, and, hey, you've all got a question, please. I, I, you're, you're, I'm not the person like, you cannot interrupt my class. All right, so this is three. <laughs> This is 3, and so that's the 3 plus 5. So, so why don't I do this in, in order for clarity? Why don't I say this is 3 feet plus 5 feet, and then I'll say you know, here's where I'm getting the dimensions, 3 feet and 5 feet. So, yeah. Is that, is that good? Is everybody okay with that? Rumble, rumble, rumble. So delta A is... Delta B times 8 over 3, right? It's going to be bigger, so 0, uh, 0.216 times 8 thirds. 
And so what does that come out to be? Excuse me. 0 0.576 inches. Okay. Sound good? All right. So if I have delta A and I have the length of A, can I determine the strain of A? Not too bad, right? So all I got to do is now say the strain in A is delta A over LA, which is um, 0 0.576 divided by 48. Again, this is where like having your units down makes sense. Like I'm sort of throwing some unit conversions at you that aren't like completely necessary, partially because I want to make sure you're applying appropriate bookkeeping. See, strain is unitless. So whatever this is, this is inches, this needs to be inches too. So keep that consistent. Okay. So what are we getting for uh, uh, epsilon sub A? Do I have a second on that? All right. What do you think? It's not too bad, right? Not too bad? All right. Okay. Oh. Okay. So I want to briefly introduce stress strain relationships. Okay. Now I'm curious for you mechanicals. How many mechanicals in here have already had 215? Engineering 215. You're in it right now. Okay. Have you discussed doing a stress strain test? Okay. All right. Well, you're about to see a graph of it again. For those of you civils, you're going to do this in 321 probably next year. So. Um, but I want to introduce you to the concept, okay? So uh, basically what we're talking about is the relationship between stress and strain. So here, here's the, the deal in a nutshell, okay? Stresses and strains are very, very important concepts in engineering because they take the geometry out of the scenario. And so what I mean by that is this. Let's say I've got this eraser, okay, and I'm pushing on it like this, okay? Now, for the sake of discussion, let's just say this eraser is one big rectangle. How do I compute the volume of this rectangle? I take the base times the height times the length, right? Okay. Stresses and strains serve a very, very important aspect because they take the geometry out of the situation. What I mean by that, stress is the force I'm applying divided by the area. So there's the base and the height. That's gone. Okay. Strain takes the length out of the scenario because it's change in length divided by the original length. So stresses and strains remove the geometry. Why is that important? Because if I remove the geometry out of the situation, I can now start to understand this material. This eraser is made out of like a compressed styrofoam. Okay? And so if I understand the behavior of this compressed styrofoam, then it doesn't matter if this eraser is this big or if it's this big or if it's cylindrical or whatever shape it is. I can then start to understand some behavior about compressed styrofoam. And so that's what stress and strain does for us. Okay? By removing the geometry uh, out of the situation, we can begin to characterize the behavior of materials. That's really important because once we understand that, we can start to get into design. Okay, that beam needs to be made out of steel and it needs to be this big, or this beam needs to be made out of concrete and this big. This far part needs to be made out of aluminum, what have you. The arguably the most common way that we as engineers understand the behavior of the material is we perform what's called a tension test. Okay. So, so the way that works is we take uh, a series of material samples, and I've got different material samples for different types of uh, materials. So over here on the right, this would be a very standard type of sample that you would use if you were testing uh, concrete. So when you all take uh, construction or civil engineering materials, you're actually going to cast concrete cylinders and go test them in the lab. 
Concrete is a material that behaves very, very well in compression. So th those samples are engineered to be pushed on, to be pushed until failure. Over here on the right, this, these are more common specimens that you would use for tension tests. So like alloys and, and nylons and plastics and things like that. But the idea is that you go down to the lab and, and in a controlled setting and using uh, uh, precise equipment with controlled rates, you actually take these samples and you break them. You load them until failure. You load them at a very, very uh, controlled rate and, and through a, a precise uh, 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 you know, set of calibrated, you know, with a precise set of calibrated instruments and whatnot. And the idea is that you record that response, okay? And again, by taking the geometry out, so by taking out, you know, the cross-sectional area of this bar and then the length of this bar, you can then uh, ultimately determine the behavior of that material. And so we've got enough time, so I do want to show you all a short little video on um, what a stress-strain curve looks like. Uh, it's using uh, metric units and some of the notation is not really consistent with what you, what we use, but the video itself is uh, is really really good. So let me pull this up. All right, so I'm going to put the speakers on on the TV. If this thing blasts you, I'm very sorry with the, the noise. Okay. That's not so bad. The tensile test. First test, material with no fault phenomenon. In the first tensile test, a plain carbon steel with no fault phenomenon is to be tested. This is the test with an original diameter of 10 millimeters and an original base length of 100 millimeters. Within this test region, distance marks have been drawn at regular intervals. They help to visualize and measure the plastic behavior of the specimen. Using a hand control, the tester moves the upper curl head into its correct starting position. Now we can place the threaded end of the test piece in the lower and upper to its working position and checks that everything is correctly prepared. Then he selects all necessary testing parameters from the control procedure. Ready. The test starts and the extensometer's tensor arms are carefully pressed onto the test piece. This way, the gauge length can be measured throughout the whole tensile test. The gauge length is displayed at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. At the beginning, it amounts to 100 millimeters. During the tensile test, the test piece is slowly and constantly elongated with a standardized speed. The fault that the test piece occasions due to increased elongation is recorded and can be seen at the bottom left-hand corner of the computer display. The material behavior can best be observed in a fault elongation diagram. The force F is being plotted upwards on the vertical axis. The elongation delta L towards the right on the horizontal axis. At first, the force rises rapidly. Force and elongation are proportional and form a steep straight line in the diagram. In this area, the material behaves elastically. If the test piece were to be unloaded from this area, it would spring back completely to its original length. In materials with no fault phenomenon, the end of the elastic area can be seen clearly. The plastic deformation starts abruptly and is accompanied by a sudden drop of force. If the test piece were to be unloaded now, it would not spring back to the original length, but instead show a perfect elongation. In the next stage of the tensile test, the gauge length constantly goes up over the slight fluctuation of the force. This phenomenon is called the zero effect.
when I teach the class, I usually go boom. The notation we use is a, is a little different. So. They can be sharp, so be careful if you all are in lab and do that. This one's a little faster. In this case, we took a precipitation equation and a minimum annual. The test proved to have exactly the same results as our measure of temperature measurement of the first time. The different interval was a marginal diameter of 10 millimeters and a marginal gradient of 100 millimeters. After finding the results of this initial test equation and carrying the mixture of common chemical types and ages, a smooth and gradual transition from linear elastic behavior to plasma conglomeration. In the further phase of the tensile test, the force increases and the test piece again is strained uniformly along its length. At the point maximum force and length develops and all subsequent plasma conglomeration is confined to this length and can fracture finally the first gap. Um, I'm going to stop the video here, but there's one quick point I, I, I want to make. Um, those two test specimens were the exact same size, exact same diameter, exact same length, but the difference is that they were made of two materials. One of the things about this test is that it removes the geometry from the situation. You can't say, well, those two specimens behave differently because they were different sizes. That's not the case. They were essentially the same size. The reason that you're getting different looking curves, I and mean, that curve looks a lot different than the one for steel, is because they are different materials. So that's why the stress strain uh, test is one of the most fundamental tests that we do in engineering period, because it characterizes the materials that we use for design. And we'll talk about the anatomy of those curves and how to interpret them and how to generate them next week. I've got the sign-in sheet here for anybody who didn't get a chance to sign in. I'll leave that up here. Y'all have a wonderful weekend. I will see you on Tuesday. Yes. It is, and there's a link on the, the slides. So.